Even if you haven't played the Soulsborns, you've almost certainly heard of them. Often described as punishingly difficult, the Dark Souls games and their spin-offs, to use a bit of a loose term, are reminiscent of a time when you had to figure games out for yourself, and you would get better the more that you worked at them. It's a bit like a training montage, except you actually have to put in the work. All that scene from Batman Begins. Why do we fall, sir? So that we can learn to pick ourselves up. In this video, I will present to you my ranking of the Soulsborns, and talk a little about them as I do, no doubt pissing off tons of diehard fans in the process. For the purposes of this video, Soulsborns are defined as difficult but fair games released by From Software. Starting at the bottom, I really wanted to like Dark Souls 2. Its presentation is still lovely today, and I had heard good things about the original. Perhaps if I'd played Dark Souls 2 at the time, I might feel a bit different. But as it is, I found Scholar of the First Sin to be the only game in the modern From Software catalogue to go against the tough but fair design philosophy. It's like someone just spammed copy and paste on the enemies. I'm not averse to taking on large groups at all, and ambushes in Souls Bonds are par for the course, but Dark Souls 2 very quickly started to feel like work. And in one section near the start, I found an area with tons of dead bodies. Obviously, they all got up to come and see me, but they all just sort of swarmed like aggressive lemmings, whereas large groups in other Soulsborne games will generally coordinate their attacks. But the end result here felt a bit like this. Stop zapping yourself! Stop zapping yourself! Stop zapping yourself! I'm fully willing to open myself up to debate on this one, as Dark Souls 2 is the last game in the whole series that I came to. Having already experienced the exceptional standards set by the later games, perhaps I've been too harsh on this one, but for now, this is where I stand. Next up, it's the original Dark Souls. The second game I played in the series, after Elden Ring, Dark Souls was instantly familiar, and I could see all too clearly where so many of the ideas and mechanics I had just platinumed had taken shape back in the day. Even with the slower pacing, Dark Souls still packs a hell of a challenge. I don't like that your spell usage is restricted to a stock of uses instead of having a refillable magic gauge, for example, but it's a minor gripe in an otherwise brilliant game. Right at the start, Dark Souls puts you in a scenario that's a little bit like a worst case scenario interview question. You're almost immediately faced with an overwhelmingly huge boss monster, and you have only a broken sword to your name. Do you fight, or do you run? If you run, you find a sort of tutorial section, and you get better equipment, and you finish up on a balcony overlooking the boss monster. From here, do you go back and face him on his own terms, or do you jump down and try to go for his head? So right at the start, you'll have a much easier time of things, and you'll have gotten a lovely bonus for landing a headshot. All of this is available to you, and it's up to you to figure out what you do. Dark Souls can be as easy or as hard as you want to make it. Okay, maybe not easy, but hopefully you get what I'm saying. Also, special shout out to the interconnected level design of Dark Souls 1. In my opinion, it's the best in the entire series, and almost makes up for the fact that you can't walk between bonfires until much later in the game. Sekiro, Shadows Die Twice. I'm sure you're all sharpening your katanas as we speak, but hear me out on this one. Placing this low on a Souls list is still miles ahead of so many other games today. And I'm placing Sekiro here because for me, it's just not a Soulsborne. Of course, it shares a lot of the Soulsborne design philosophies, and it's really, really good. But for me, every Soulsborne game is loaded with choice, and they all share the same control scheme at their core. Dodging, blocking, parrying, they're all largely the same. And probably the biggest change ever made to the Souls controls over the year is when Elden Ring gave us a jump button. Sekiro changed so much of this, and it's absolutely fantastic, but instead of giving the player choice, it really doubled down on the get good or go home ideology. If you play Sekiro long enough, you will get the hang of it, and the system of parry and counter types is immensely satisfying when you pull them off, but your character has one build and one fighting style. Sure you have your super cool ninja tools, but they're not game breakers like the Moonlight Greatsword or the Sword of Night and Flame. You have to learn Sekiro, and once you do, it's absolutely a Neo Sees the Matrix moment. To be clear, Sekiro is a freaking amazing ninja game and I absolutely love it, but if it wasn't made by From Software, I wouldn't even have it on this list. Next up, Demon's Souls PS5 Remake. 
If Demon's Souls was the only game I owned for the PS5, I would not regret buying either the game or the console. It is absolutely amazing, and even three years into the current console generation, it's still a rare example of a true next-gen experience. Despite being a reimagining of an old game, Demon's Souls handles better than any other game in the series. It's mind-blowingly beautiful, somehow making dark and oppressive environments look way more gorgeous than they have any right to be, and it has been crafted with a level of precision and care that the end result is smoother than butter on a silk plate of satin toast. Heck, even the character creator blew me away. Unlike Dark Souls, Demon's Souls has you operating out of a central hub area, with distinct levels accessible via teleporters. The different areas open up to reveal the series' signature interconnected level designs as you progress, and each area has multiple bosses to discover. Demon's Souls also experimented with a sort of morality system, where your actions can make both your character and the separate worlds lighter or darker, and both the difficulty and the available rewards would be altered accordingly. It's not something you really have to worry about, as it'll just happen as you play, and it presents some excellent bonuses and additional challenges when you retread old ground. Also unlike Dark Souls, your spell usage isn't tied to a number of uses, so if you're using Demon Souls to pop your soul's cherry, a magic build is an even more viable option, with the royalty class in particular allowing you to one-shot a lot of the starter enemies. Seriously, if you own a PS5 and subscribe to PS Plus, you can play this game for free, and it won't take you long to appreciate why it's still topping best PS5 game lists, even though it was a launch title. Bloodborne. Now we're getting to the real nitty gritty of it all. For my TED talk on Bloodborne, I'm going to focus on speed and aggression, and how in some ways, your adventure as a hunter was the most accessible soul style title for the time. Bloodborne was the first of all the games on this list to really ramp up the pace, and in a genius move, you were actually rewarded for aggressive play. Whilst it was still entirely possible to pull a Leroy Jenkins and screw yourself over, the rally system introduced in Bloodborne gave you a short window to reclaim lost health by attacking the enemy that damaged you. Suddenly, being aggressive wasn't just a cheerleading mantra, it was a worthwhile tactic and a literal game changer. Your speedy hunter and their armory of transforming trick weapons were a breath of fresh air, and fortune would often favour the bold. In a further genius move, From Software took away your shield and replaced it with a gun. It took me an embarrassingly long time to realise that your gun is for defence, and to this day I have yet to encounter a more user-friendly parry system. I noted in my review of Bloodborne that it doesn't allow for the same variety of builds that you get in other Souls titles, and I stand by this, but you're still afforded a ton of freedom and tactical choices. Having a flame-infused serrated weapon will absolutely shred beast-type enemies for example, and broccoli-headed lightning god has to be experienced to be believed, and I will always credit Bloodborne for pioneering the Soulsborne catwalk and totally making fashion souls a thing. All of this gushing aside, why isn't Bloodborne higher on my list? I'm sure most of you have already guessed, it's locked at 30 FPS. I really don't mean to be a snob, but in the current gaming climate, this is very noticeable. And why we haven't had a PS5 port genuinely confuses me. Next up, it's Dark Souls 3. For the longest time, Dark Souls 3 was my number one Soulsborne game. I came to Dark Souls 3 after already having the platinums for Elden Ring and Bloodborne, and I still found it to be a steep learning curve. Dark Souls 3 is a fast, unashamedly brutal masterpiece, and one of the very finest games of the PS4 generation. In the fashion of a truly excellent sequel, Dark Souls 3 built upon the successes of its predecessors, trimmed the fat, and added cool new features to help lighten your load a bit. If you imagine the speed and ferocity of Bloodborne, but more in vain with traditional Souls gameplay, as in, you can actually defend, and not just attack to defend, then you're halfway there. The other half of Dark Souls 3 is having more build and item variety than you can shake a very sharp stick at, more customization options than you've ever seen, a significant leap in visual quality, and weapon arts, which are like special moves built into your weapons. Believe me when I say these headlines are only the tip of the savage iceberg, Dark Souls 3 needs to be experienced to be believed. Any Soulsborne player will be able to instantly recall their most memorable bosses from the whole series, and to date there are only four that I approach with any real level of apprehension when I do replays. Now I don't mean this in a fearful way as such, but more the knowledge that they have real potential to give me a hard time, regardless of my experience. And two of them are from Dark Souls 3. The first is the Dancer of the Boreal Valley, 
And the second? Well, I'm sure you can guess. And finally, we arrive at my top spot. And it could only be... Elden Ring. Where to even begin? Like so, so many of you, I started my Souls journey right here in the lands between. I got sucked in by all the hype and perfect review scores, and the promise of accessibility and the opportunity to carve out my own adventure and learn at my own pace. Whilst I do stand by my opinion that Demon Souls is also a great starting point, I'm glad I took the plunge with Elden Ring instead. The freedom available to you in every possible sense of the word is unparalleled. And as I came to Elden Ring immediately after snagging the Platinum in Horizon Forbidden West, I found it incredibly refreshing to have a map that wasn't oversaturated with so much busy work that it overwhelmed me more than the actual game by default. This freedom also translates to choosing how you want to play. You can absolutely make the game easier by using some of the new mechanics, like Spirit Ashes, or Obi winning your Rock Meteors, or stacking bleed damage. But you can also choose to ignore all of this and run through the game as a level 1 wretch if you want. It is entirely your choice, and every playstyle is viable. Elden Ring is your adventure, and it is the culmination of everything from software learned from their previous games, and so much more besides. It is a very big and even badder world than ever before that awaits you. Elden Ring is from software's biggest world to date, so it only makes sense that in return, you get the biggest amount of options on how you take on the challenge. The amount of weapons and equipment and talismans and spells and miracles is frankly insane. The NPCs who can help you, the spirit ashes, the amount of customization available for your equipment, as well as how much you can level it all up, and the sheer number of build possibilities for your character, it's frankly mind-blowing just how much you can do in Elden Ring, and how oddly accessible a game so difficult can be. And there we go YouTube, that was my current ranking of the Soulsborne series. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you're a Soulsborne virgin, I hope you now consider taking the plunge. If you enjoy this kind of content, please let me know by liking and subscribing. And as always, I would love to hear your take down in the comments. What's your favourite Soulsborne game, and please do tell me why. In case you haven't heard this today, you're doing just fine, and I promise it does get better. Thank you very much for watching. Baldy, out.